So welcome to Science News. My name is Dr. Ralph Sacco, former president of the American Heart Association. And we're here in San Diego, beautiful sunny San Diego at the International Stroke Conference. And I'm talking about one of the late breaking abstracts with Dr. David Spence from Canada. So David, tell me a little bit about this uh, project that you're gonna be telling us about on the platform tomorrow on TCD and Peyton Frame in Ovalle. Right, so Peyton Frame in Ovalle is a condition that cardiologists have some doubt about, neurologists have less doubt about. Right. We know that people have strokes called paradoxical emboli where they get a blood clot that goes from a vein in the leg usually through a hole in the heart up to the brain. The problem is that 25% of people have that hole in the heart, the patent frame in Ovalle, um, and only about 5.5% of strokes are due to paradoxical embolism. Right. So there's a big problem with the studies that have been done to try and decide whether it's a good idea to patch the hole. Right. Um, if you take all stroke patients, about 80% of PFOs are incidental. Right. Um, Fowler and Kent reported in Stroke a couple of years ago that among patients with cryptogenic stroke, it's still half of the PFOs that are incidental. So we need ways to identify among patients with stroke and a PFO which ones were more likely to be paradoxical emboli. And one issue that I think is less recognized than it should be is that there are clinical clues, and we published this in right. 2008. Ozken Ozdemir was one of our fellows. Patients who wake up with a stroke, patients with a Valsalva maneuver at the onset of the stroke, dyspnea at the onset of the stroke, people with a history of prolonged sitting, like a flight to Hong right. Kong. Very important. Um, all of those patients, people with a previous history of DVT or pulmonary emboli or varicose veins, all those patients are more likely to have a PFO right. in the setting. So of, those uh, historical features yeah. are important, but then testing, which is what right. your abstract's all about. I mean, we all think, you know, transesophageal echo is the gold standard, but TCD was what you found, correct? Yeah, and in the past, some of the studies, for example, Ma and others have suggested that uh, mobile interatrial septum and atrial septal aneurysm were imaging features that could identify high-risk PFO. But your study and the, and the, the large study by, by Kent and Thaler and others, in fact, didn't find uh, that, that. And what we've done is we've taken 300-odd patients mm -hmm. with cryptogenic stroke, suspected of having a PFO who had transcranial Doppler embolus detection. Um, and we found that 15% of, uh, among those who had a transesophageal echo, which was about 280 of the cases, the transesophageal echo missed the PFO in 15% of the cases. Mm. And as you would expect, most of the ones that were missed were small shunts. Were small. Sure. But in fact, 20% of them were quite large, and 5% were grade five Spencer grade shunts. That's a big, wide open. Uh, and these are the TEEs with agitated saline, yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. and so they all have agitated saline. And transthoracic echo, did you have that? We often have known that transthoracic echo is not as good as transcranial Doppler and not as good as TEE, but it's surprising that TCD, you're saying, is even more sensitive than TEE. Yeah, and not only more sensitive, but the TCD shunt grade was more predictive of events. Of so events. patients with the, for the shunt grade of three or greater had a significantly higher risk of stroke or TIA during the follow-up of about three years, whereas the presence of a shunt on TE did not predict events, mm. nor did a combination of mobile interatrial septum and septal aneurysm did not predict did events. Did not predict. So that's important. So then it goes back to that old size. Do you think size does matter in terms of PFO and stroke risk? What it may not just be size. There's some. There's a nice little letter to the editor in Stroke that with the name with the word Cinderella. Cinderella. Um, he calls TCD the Cinderella of Peyton Freeman Ovalle, and he talks about things like the the sinus of Valsalva and things that might direct bubbles towards the uh -huh. hole. Um, but uh, another issue is that TCD is way cheaper than echocardiography. You can get a TCD machine for about $30,000. It costs a quarter of a million for right. a good duplex scanner. The training to do the test is you could do it, you can get trained in a weekend in Seattle.
So in your study, TCD was superior to TEE in terms of uh, PFO detection and related to outcome, but obviously there are still important things that we learn from TEE that are important to cryptogenic stroke patients. Yeah, we right? have to regard TCD and TEE as being complementary right. because you're still going to have patients with a ventricular aneurysm, ventricular dysfunction, um, atrial myxoma, right. valve problems, appendage thrombus, maybe um, in this, thrombus, right? Yeah, so we still need TEE, right. but for sorting out which patients with a PFO might be more likely to respond to patching, the TCD seems to be better. Well, you, better. you really haven't addressed the treatment issues, which, as we know, there are trials out there, some more controversial than others, but you do show a nice relationship between um, the findings on TCD in terms of the amount of shunting, it sounds like, and the outcomes, which is intriguing. Maybe looking for a higher risk population that we should think about uh, yeah. trying the patch or clamps. And I think the big problem with the trials is that if you take a bunch of patients with cryptogenic stroke and PFO and randomize them, if right. half of them are incidental, right. you've got a real problem with power. So I've suggested to some of the investigators that they need a questionnaire to try and identify a subgroup at higher risk. Do they have a history of a Valsalva maneuver, a long plane ride, shortness right. of breath at the onset, these clinical clues. And what does the TCD show? Yeah. You know, another important way of then measuring risk and then taking that high risk group and then thinking about a randomized trial. That could right. be an interesting trial for the future. So this has been great. You know, you heard it here today at Science News. We're really looking forward to your presentation, and I think it'll be a very important hot news at the uh, International Stroke Conference in San Diego. Thank you for listening to Science News. Thank you.